What's going on guys, it's Bromley from Empire Barbell and today we're gonna to discuss phase potentiation. Now if you found this video helpful, go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button and click the notification bell so you get updates as we put them out. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave it in the comment box. I appreciate everybody's support, you guys have been great. So going into phase potentiation, if we are following a type of training that emphasizes discrete periods of training several weeks at a time, there's an idea that if we select for the right training thresholds or right exercise variables, that we can set ourselves up to do better in each successive phase. That makes a certain type of sense. Think about any linearly directed program that we might run. It stands to reason that if I get really good at tens in the beginning, that's probably gonna have more to do with my ability to do eights than it will have to do with my ability to do singles. I might get strong in that period of time, but those adaptations are not strength specific. So I'm not going to get as good at singles doing tens as if I'm specifically training closer to that rep range. So the idea of setting myself up for the next phase by doing certain things now that will better carry over to that phase does make a certain type of sense. Now there are certain things you wanna keep in mind when you are writing out a program that has a certain direction over time. There are elements of phase potentiation that are very important, but what I'm going to address is where the complexity that people get into actually becomes detrimental to getting a good result. A lot of the information we have regarding topics like this is studied in the context of track and field or team sports, where there are a lot more variables at play. And specialists in the field of exercise science have done a very fine job of trying to label and control for every single possible variable. I maintain that there is a point of complexity where we can no longer micromanage every variable and we're going to be better suited by making sure our attention is always on the broadest, truest principles and making sure we get the best out of those instead of trying to really hyper fixate on every tiny little thing. So I wanna start with this study that was conducted that cast a little bit of doubt on how effective phase potentiation actually is. So to give you a little backstory on this, uh, James et al. back 2017 ran this study. It was published in a Scandinavian exercise science journal. And basically they took two groups, a strong and weak group, and had them run two five-week blocks that are illustrated here. So the idea was to test a prevailing thought that maximal strength training should always precede ballistic training when it comes to developing high velocity strength. What better way to test that than to have two groups one of which was already strong. The idea of doing max strength training first is that you get strong. So the idea was that stronger lifters, stronger athletes would do better with this type of phase potentiation than weak lifters. So they graded them over three qualities, maximum isometric force production, jump peak velocity, and jump height. So in each block, that's one, two, and three over here. We started out in block one with power cleans at 70%, jump squats at 40 to 50% of a squat max, hand cleans and snatch grip, so a lot of barbell work there. And then over here, they raise the power cleans up a little bit heavier, reduce the jump squat percentages, and then swapped out the Olympic accessory work with plyometrics, split squats, and uh, plyo split squats, and drop jumps. So this is a phase potentiated progression that has to do with the development of high velocity force production, high velocity strength. So in the beginning, the strong group did extraordinarily well. This is a percent change. You can see that these traits increased at a substantially greater pace than in the weak group. So it looked like the first five weeks really validated this idea of phase potentiation. Stronger lifters simply did better once you incorporated this type of training. Into the next five weeks though, what you saw was the weak group increase at a similar rate that they did for the first block. What you saw with the strong group is that some of these numbers actually decreased, that detrained as they moved into this phase potentiated block. If you're to add the growth here and here, what you get is total net growth that is pretty much in line with what the strong group did if you incorporate the loss of progress in the later five weeks. So Chris Beardsley put together this visual representation and he basically said this long held idea that strength training, max strength training before ballistic training is somehow optimal, really got challenged by the fact that this study shows that everything comes out in the wash. Now these studies are limited and this is a big problem with all studies in the field of exercise science. There's a lot of questions that they don't ask. There's a lot of measurement problems. There's a lot of consistency problems. And the longer you can take data, the more accurate, the more relevant it's gonna to be to real life given that long-term growth takes a lot of time and isn't directly linear and there's a lot of variables that affect it. However, this does address a problem that a lot of studies don't address and that is what happens next, what happens later on. There's a lot of studies that are six weeks of DUP versus linear, six weeks of 
full squats versus partial squats. And what they don't take into account is the need for variation that comes with more specialization from training the same thing over and over. This could very well be that the stronger group had spent a lot more time doing strength specific work. So by the time they went into a phase like this, they were much more primed for growth. That's very possible. It also could be the face potentiation works well in the beginning, but the repeated bout effect is much more substantial the stronger you are, which means the parameters have to be different for stronger, more developed athletes than with weaker ones. Again, there's a lot of questions this brings up, but it does shed light on the fact that face potentiation is not as straightforward and not as cut and dry as you might want to believe. So for all of you lifters, all of you power lifters, all of you strength athletes, we have the benefit of only having to really focus on a couple of different variables and those become a lot easier to stack on top of each other over time. So there's kind of a broader question now, which is how much complexity should you force into your program? I think there's this myth that spreads that the only way that you become a champion is by focusing on every little single bit of minutia and that by doing that, you're actually doing yourself a service. What gets lost in that is the fact that there is only so much attention and so many resources available to you. So what really happens as you try to micromanage your training is that you actually end up distracting from more important things. Remember the 80-20 rule. Now this isn't really hard, fast, concrete math, but it is a broad conceptual idea that's pretty relevant here. And that is that 80% of your efforts only determine 20% of your results. And most of your results are gonna come from these few things, the 20% of your efforts that are actually really important. As complexity increases, I always get skeptical of people who think they're gonna get a better result by micromanaging the complexity. The human brain, as wonderful as it is, has very limited ability to coordinate multiple variables all at once. And as complexity stacks up, we usually end up spinning our wheels and getting frustrated. As complexity does increase, we tend to get the best result when we just fixate on principles that select for the right answer, instead of trying to white knuckle the steering wheel, thinking that we can navigate through this complex maze without making a wrong turn. Usually we end up wasting all of our resources on things that don't matter that much, while forgetting or ignoring the really vital things that really support all of the progress that we're trying to get. So think of different economic systems or different types of businesses. If you have a type of business that allows for, let's say, creative freedom, where people can play into their strengths, and it just incentivizes good work by giving some type of monetary reward, people are left to their own devices and they end up working in their own best interest. In a broader sense, they end up working for everybody by actually producing something that's useful either to the company or to the economy as a whole. In a very complex system, like a large business or corporation or an entire economy, you predictably get a better result by only incorporating a few principles that select for the right answer. And over time, that tends to give a lot more growth and a lot more predictable success than a scenario where you have individual managers white knuckling the steering wheel and trying to control what every single person is doing at every time. That's generally how you take missteps. And that's shown itself in economies in the past where let's say an agricultural mistake has led to the starvation of millions. And many of you have probably experienced this personally by working in some type of corporate structure where middle management makes himself responsible for every single decision that you ever make. And you see very quickly how that becomes untenable. It's not just frustrating. It routinely steers against the best possible course of action. So whenever things get overly complex, think about what is actually responsible for the growth that I'm going to get. Is it really about magically stacking together different phases in just the right order so that I realize just the most optimal amount of growth in this set period of time? Or is it more about including enough variety over time that you avoid stagnation and the repeated bout effect and that you consistently grow each capacity every time you revisit those phases? We can look at plenty of examples where world champions have been made with wildly different modes of training. And I already cited how the USSR's inclusion of periodization actually didn't improve how they did at the Olympics. We have world champions who are made off purely linear methods. We have world champions who are made off of concurrent methods. We have world champions who are made off of just about anything that included some steady method of progressive overload, some method of consistent variation, some consideration of recovery, and some consistent long-term effort over time. The other thing that we don't talk about is that every training philosophy like this has its own learning curve which means the more you fixate on minutia like this, the more time you have to spend getting it down and figuring out what the exact rules are to get the desired effect. So eventually you have to ask yourself, what is the benefit of trying to incorporate something like this given so many systems that have thrived without it and all of the time you're gonna to have to spend getting it down in the first place. 
Earlier I made the comment that going from tens to eights makes more sense than going from tens to ones, but I often wonder what would happen if we did jumble those thresholds. If my long-term progression was to do say tens and then move into a phase of threes and then go back to sixes and repeat the cycle over, do I know that that wouldn't yield as good of results as if I did everything in a linear fashion? I don't know that and I don't really have a good reason to believe it. As long as I improved in each phase and as long as there was an overall kind of progressive overload that kept each phase moving up, I don't really have reason to believe that one would be really superior to the other. It makes a kind of sense that the linear organization would work a little better, but there really isn't anything empirical to suggest that's the case, especially when you consider moves like the decoupling of volume and intensity. So long story short, it doesn't appear to be that proper programming is like walking a tightrope, even though many people make it seem that way. As long as you're abiding by bigger principles and everything is continuing over time, don't sweat the small stuff. It doesn't matter exactly what exercises you put at which phase. There might be a certain rationalization that merits one over another, but at the end of the day, it is the long-term growth that you get from the steady incorporation of progressive overload that is going to be responsible for your growth. Stop obsessing over trying to squeeze an extra one or 2% out of each phase and consider more how much work you can do this month and how many of those months you can stack together. This year into next year is the important thing, not necessarily exactly how you bridge one phase into the next. Remember, when you start to get frustrated and you feel like you wanna bash your head against the wall because you can't handle all of the complexity of programming, there have been people in prison who have gotten accidentally stronger than you are right now. You have access to a gym, you have access to good nutrition, all you need to do is incorporate some method of progressive overload, account for recovery, and just the right amount of variation when things start to get stagnant. That is all you need. So when things start to get overwhelming, just remember, keep it simple, stupid. That's all I got for today. Go ahead and leave your comments and questions in the comment box or take it over at empire-forum.com. Until next time, this is Bromley Empire Barbell. I'll see you.